It's been said that every quilt tells a story, and it's so true. But I also believe every quilter has a story to tell. I wanted to hear about the people behind these wonderful quilts and thought you'd enjoy hearing about their lives also. Welcome to A Quilter's Life. Like many of us, Diane Elmertha started with mostly traditional quilting. Gradually, she modified patterns more and more, making her quilts unique, as well as creating her own original designs. Over the last eight years, she has been participating in art quilt challenges. Diane has found the challenges are an excellent opportunity to get out of her comfort zone. She hopes to encourage you to do the same and experience the joy and personal satisfaction of these challenges. Diane, thanks so much for joining me on A Quilter's Life. Good morning, Paula. It's great to be here. So glad to have you. Could you tell me, how did you hear about A Quilter's Life? Sure. I have some fabulous quilting friends and buddies, and they are super supportive of me doing my lectures and workshops and even my new book. And as I was talking about things, several people told me about you, and I really appreciated that. Several of them are regular listeners, and they shared the information about you. Well, thank you to your friends. Were there any shout outs you wanted to give? One specifically to Pat Price. Well, thank you, Pat. Diane, let's jump back to where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Davenport, Iowa, which is on the eastern side of the state of Iowa, right along the Mississippi River. And actually from our big two-story house where I grew up, we could look out the windows and see the Mississippi River, which is flooded, (laughs) flooding Davenport right now. But was here through college. I went to a local college, which is now a university, and then worked locally here until I took a job in Heidelberg, Germany. It was a transfer job with the Department of the Army. So was here until almost 1999 and then left for Heidelberg, Germany. We were in Northern Virginia for 11 years. And then we ended up back here to help my mom as she aged. So I'm back in Bettendorf, which is like the little sister town to Davenport. And we've been here for seven years now. So far away and to be able to come back. That's wonderful. Now, you mentioned going to Germany, working for the army. So were you a civil servant or in the military? Uh, Good question. I was a civil servant and military are automatically rotated around and they have to go where they are required to go. But civilians can volunteer. So I volunteered to leave my position in Rock Island, Illinois, and go to Heidelberg. And it was a five year tour. And it lets me have return rights to my job back here in the States. But in the meantime, I met my husband, who was an active duty soldier for the U.S. Army, and we went to Northern Virginia, and that's where we got married. It's so interesting how all that military works. Yeah, it is. You get connections all around the world. Some of them last a lifetime. Others are just a moment in time. But we've had some really wonderful memories. had opportunities to travel to some very neat places. And I wouldn't change a thing. I would do it all over again. So I take it that was your employment. Was there anything else you wanted to share about what you did in your job? My background was in accounting and business. And then I got a master's in business and resource management. So kind of very structured background, education wise. So what I did with the Army, it worked really well there, but it didn't allow me to be very creative with my quilting, and nor did I have very much time to do my quilting because it was a very demanding job. But I took an early retirement after 32 years, and that's when I was really able to start being more creative with my quilting. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Well, I jumped ahead because I got so excited about hearing about being a civil servant. So could you share a special childhood memory? Yes. And this is related to quilting. My grandparents lived on a small farm in southern Iowa, and we went there fairly often. That was like our family vacations, you know, three or four times a year to go visit grandma and grandpa on the farm. And we got to run and just have free range over the farm. And it was a lot of fun, go fishing and all that. But my grandmother is who taught me to quilt. And I remember we were working on a small little doll quilt. We were hand stitching. And my stitches were too big, and she made me tear them out and redo them. I was terribly embarrassed because I love my grandmother, and and I thought, oh my gosh, these weren't good enough. But it was a very good lesson because I still have that doll quilt, and it's over 50 years old, (laughs) (laughs) and it has now held up because she taught me the valuable lesson of the importance of small stitches in your quilting. What a special item to have for that memory of your grandma. So do you keep that in a special place? I do. I first tried to frame it so I could have it on a wall, but I have been showing it in some of my lectures. Oftentimes people want to see what was your first quilt, you know? So I have been showing that quite regularly, but When it's not traveling with me, I have a spot in my sewing room where I hang it on the wall very carefully and I can just look up and see it. And I have a picture of me and my grandma framed and that's kind of on the shelf below it. So I think that's kind of cool. (laughs) (laughs) That is. Also in her sewing kit, she had multiple tape measures and little packs of needles. And the other thing that I thought was very interesting in her straight pin box, she had like religious medals, several of them. This goes back a ways. I made like shadow boxes, one for me, my sister and my mom with a bit of her tape measure. I used one of her single blocks as the background, the pins. And won each of those medals from her pin box and with some other little stuff from her sewing box, just so that we can each have that shadow box kind of thing of her sewing supplies. How cool. And how wonderful of you to make that to share with your family. Well, you went full circle. You mentioned that you came back to Iowa to help your mom. Did you want to share how that came about? Sure. My dad died rather unexpectedly in 2016. And my husband and I had been foster parents in Virginia. And both of us working full-time jobs, that was kind of a lot. (laughs) Being older, foster parents with three young children. And we kind of decided that... One of us should retire so that there was a little more balance and time for the kids. So I was going to be the one to take the early retirement just because of the timing and the system and everything. Well, then my husband said, you know, we've been giving to other people's families for a long time. My parents were both aging and my husband and God love him for this is he said, let's move back to Iowa so we can be closer to your family and spend quality time with them while they're still around and as they need more and more help. So we were on the track of, I retired, and then my husband was going to start looking for jobs in the Davenport, Quad City area. And I might get a little emotional here, but I retired on like the 28th of January, and my dad died on the 31st of January. And again, it was unexpected, but my husband says, your dad knew you were coming home. So he knew you were coming home to help and you would be there to help your mom. So as people were sending me congratulations on your retirement flowers, (laughs) I was getting condolence cards. (laughs) Anyway, I went home and helped my mom immediately. 
And then my husband was able to find a job within, I don't say six or nine months. Then we both moved to Iowa. I thought it was ironic, but things happen for a reason. And my husband is right. My dad knew my intention was to come there and be with them. And I think that was enough that he knew I was going to be there. And how wonderful for your mom that you didn't start thinking about it after he passed. And then you wouldn't have been able to be there as quickly. So, wow. Yeah, that is true and a very good point. We had all the wheels in motion. They knew that was the plan. And we were able then to continue on with that plan, execute that plan, and get back to Iowa in a relatively short period of time. Mm -hmm. Diane, is there anything else about your family you wanted to share with us? I guess the only thing is just that we did the foster care. And I have two stepsons, and I definitely think of them as my children. They are grown and raised now. So <laughs> we did the foster care. And so many people will say, oh, I couldn't do that. It would just break my heart when they leave. Well, I guess I want to just encourage people to help with foster care, either being full-time foster parents or doing the respite, which is when you give the foster parents a break by taking the kids for a weekend or one overnight or something. It is hard to let them go, but it's just kind of along the same lines of letting your kids go off to college and, you know, drive away for their first job. We just think about it as we have these children for a limited amount of time. We do not know how long that will be. And it's our job to keep them safe and healthy and just love them as much as we can and let them know that they are loved and that there are good people out there. And if they work hard and make good decisions, that they can also have everything that's good in life, no matter where they started from. So we really enjoyed it. It was rewarding. Yes, it is hard to let them go back to sometimes unknown situations, but I have learned that it's better to help them than to just say, oh, it would be too hard on me. That's all about me. It's not about them. And fostering is about giving them a good loving home for a small period of time. That's so wonderful. Do you have the opportunity to keep in contact with any of these kids or is just that small amount of time and then you don't know what goes on. It varies. The first set of three children still live in Alexandria, Virginia, and we are still in contact with them and very good friends with their parents. They were a good news story. They went back to their family and they've been with them for now quite a while. So it's wonderful. We've just become kind of adopted grandparents to that family. One of the other families, a set of three children, their family decided that they did not want any contact. They wanted to just do everything on their own. So I sent cards and encouraging notes for quite a long time. I think they received them, but I rarely hear back from them. And then there's three different families who have adopted the children, and we regularly stay in touch with them. And that's really wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. Now, if you could have a chance to tell your great-great-grandchildren something about yourself, what would you want them to know about you? I would say that as a child, grade school, and probably even high school, I was very shy and very quiet. It probably wasn't until college that I kind of came out of my shell. I would encourage them to not be afraid of being their own person and doing what makes them happy. Encourage them to try new things and believe in themselves. Great advice. Besides quilting, what other crafts do you do or have you done? Oh my gosh, Paula. I've done almost everything. <laughs> In my book, I refer to myself as a maker. I think I have made and tried 
a lot of things. I want to say everything, but quite a few things. I've knitted, I've crocheted, did cross stitch. I took a basket weaving class. I learned how to frame pictures. I also took a woodworking class one time. And I remember we made a wooden bread box, you know, that kind of slides open and stuff. I don't remember what else I did with that, but I just thought that would be a handy thing (laughs) to learn. (laughs) But a bread box, I don't know why that was the class project. But I canned, you know, jellies and pickles and I hand dyed fabrics. When I was a kid, I remember making little bags to hold jacks and balls. And I tried to sell them to kids at school. I also remember making little pot holders. Remember the little square kind of loom and you wove them. And <laughs> I made up a bunch of those to try to sell. And I remember my grandmother bought all of them from me. <laughs> but you name it, I think I've tried it. And I reupholstered furniture. I remember too making Barbie doll clothes from scraps of upholstery fabric, which is kind of hard to do considering the weight of upholstery (laughs) fabric and this little size of Barbie dolls. (laughs) But then I started probably junior high trying to design my own clothes. And I thought that was really fun. And I thought, okay, I'm going to be a clothes designer. But, you know, that didn't quite go the (laughs) the way I thought it was going to. But I enjoy doing stuff with my hands gardening, all of this stuff. I just super enjoy it. And so I really haven't tried painting. That's probably one thing that I haven't really done, but I've tried it all at one time or another. (laughs) (laughs) So I have to ask, do you still have your bread box? No. (laughs) (laughs) I gave it to my aunt. And she just loved it. I think she had some other kind of a bread box or something. And I gave that one to her. Yeah, it was huge. Who has room for those things on their cabinets? (laughs) How about other hobbies? Well, the two that I probably did the most and the longest was downhill skiing and kayaking. The kayaking, my husband Tim's family used to do an annual organized canoeing and kayaking trip on the Susquehanna River. And every year they did a different section. So when we got to the Northern Virginia area from Germany, we started participating with them in that. So it was all of my husband's cousins and their sons. So that was a good fun thing for us to do with our boys and for them to spend time with their first and second cousins. And we had so much fun. First, we had the boys in a canoe, and that was like cats and dogs <laughs> of fighting as they're trying to figure out who's going to do what and why do I have to listen to him kind of thing. Then we put them in kayaks. And I remember our oldest son, Robert, saying, oh, my gosh, this is like driving a car. I can go anywhere I want. <laughs> As long as you paddle, son, that is correct. If you don't paddle, you won't go anywhere. (laughs) So that was a fun family hobby. The skiing was for quite a while as well. And we used to be the first ones out on the slope and the last one in. And then as we got older, we decided, oh, let's let it warm up a little bit. We'll go out a little bit later. And then it was like, well, let's take a long lunch break and maybe go back and take a nap. (laughs) (laughs) And then, of course, you know, we start skiing slower and not doing the moguls. But here in Iowa, we have a ways to go in either direction to get to the mountains. So we have not skied since we've been here. And at this point, we probably have to sell that equipment because it's probably antiques by now. (laughs) Oh, boy. When you were in Germany, did you get to visit some of the wonderful ski places over there? Yes, absolutely. They had multiple ski clubs. And so the ski clubs would organize the trips. You got on a bus on Friday afternoon after work. They would drive you three hours or whatever it was to the mountains. 
you would ski all of Saturday and Sunday, and then late Sunday, the bus would drive you back. So that was a super convenient way to get to a lot of the mountains, all organized. So all you had to do was bring your stuff and get on the bus, and that was good. We also had some very good friends, and three or four of us would all just coordinate and plan a trip. But the one year, I remember my husband's his goal was to ski 61 separate days during the season. And he was able to do that. But skiing there starts around Thanksgiving. And the last skiing is around Easter. So usually early April or mid-April. So they have a longer ski season because, you know, you've got lots of mountains so close. But we had fabulous fabulous memories and skied wonderful places. It probably would have been easier if he didn't have to work during that time, huh? (laughs) Oh my gosh, he never would have left the mountain. (laughs) (laughs) Do you think your hobbies or other crafts show up in your quilting? I do. I have photos that I have incorporated in some of the places. The Susquehanna canoeing trips was the inspiration for one quilt that I did for Sacred Threads. And the theme was called Harmony. And Harmony led to peace and kind of quiet, peaceful, serene kind of atmosphere. And that reminded me of some sections of the river that was really quiet. And Susquehanna means crooked river. So I did something very abstract inspired by that trip. One of our ski trips with our skis kind of stuck in the snow outside a little warming hut, I used that picture as inspiration for a quilt challenge with Wisconsin Quilt Expo, which was called Winter Games. That was the name of the challenge. So those skis outside that chalet was the inspiration for that quilt that I did. I've also taken pictures of a lot of trees, just different pictures from where we've been animals, llamas. Somebody had llamas near a campground someplace. I took pictures of those. I'll take pictures of birds sitting on branches. I've used some of the trees already, but I have a big file of trees and animals of pictures I've taken that will be inspiration for future (laughs) quilts. How fun to see it all come together. If I only had enough time to do everything that's in my head. (laughs) (laughs) You mentioned that your grandma introduced you to quilting and you made that first quilt of yours. Did you keep quilting from that point or were you introduced to it again later? What happened with that? So first I'll say my grandmother taught me to quilt, to knit, to crochet cross stitch and embroider. My mom at one point thought all of that was old fashioned when she was a girl and refused to learn. Then of course she gets married, has four kids and says, gee, it would be great if I knew how to sew and stitch up quick a little jumper or a little pair of elastic shorts or something. So she insisted that my sister and I learn. So that's when my grandmother offered to teach us and we loved spending time sitting next to my grandma learning all of these things. So we would do a doll quilt. Then she would teach us to knit and we would do an afghan. So it would take us a while to get through that project as we came and went from visiting with her. But I would say I stopped and then my mom, she tortured us. She made us go to singer sewing classes in the summer when everybody else was out playing. (laughs) And then also take the home ec classes So I was sewing something, but not necessarily quilting. I remember probably high school trying to go back. And of all things, I tried to do a Lone Star quilt on my own. And I just kept thinking, well, geez, if I can sew and I did that baby quilt, I can just do this. And I remember using a bed sheet (laughs) as the backing. I did two of them, one in brown and one in blue, and I gave them to both of my brothers. And my one brother still has it. And I look at it now and say, oh my God, 
I did a five, eight inch seam allowance. (laughs) And then I thought, you know what? I really need to take a full quilting class so that I learned to do this right. So it was after college, a friend and I took a quilting class and the lady was wonderful. It was adult education class, eight weeks long. It was a sampler kind of block. So we were doing a little bit of everything. And she also wanted us to hand quilt a little bit of it. Well, because I traveled a lot for my job, I missed the first couple weeks of the course. But my friend said, well, don't worry. Diane is a competent sewer. She'll catch up and I will help her. But the teacher was like, no, she's got to come when she can be here every class. Well, I called her and said, with my job, it's just never going to happen. You know, if I drop out of this one, the next session, I'll still have some days where I'm traveling and gone. She agreed to let me stay in the class, but she was not happy about it. So at the end, I guess when we were talking about pin basting your quilts, she showed us a grapefruit spoon that has the little serrated ridge at the top. And she talked about using that to help with pin basting, getting the pins lifted up. And somehow somebody asked her, well, do you have one? And she says, no. So at the very end of the class, everybody shows their finished quilts. And I I think, you know, they were at, you know, Walmart or something, two spoons for $2 or something. So I kept one for me and I put a big bow on one of them and presented it to her. And you would have thought I just became her new best friend. She invited me to the guild. She wanted to be my roommate when we went to the Kansas City Quilt Show. (laughs) So that was my first quilting class. After that, I just kept quilting. What a great idea to use one of those serrated grapefruit spoons. There's a tool that you could buy that does the same thing. And I spent more money than I should have, I guess. (laughs) No, but I love that tool. Do you have a favorite quilt? You know, Paula, that is a tough question. All of them have some meaning for various reasons, but I do lean toward if I had to pick just one, it would be the picture of my first dog, Buddy, at the lake in Virginia. And I built that quilt for a Wisconsin Quilt Expo challenge. And it had to be done in log cabin blocks. I wanted this quilt to be very realistic. And there's a hundred books out there on log cabin blocks. Wonky log cabin, traditional log cabin, artsy log cabin, but nothing that would give me a true realistic look. So I created my own technique where I constructed each individual log, either pieced it multiple times or appliqued on it so that once each of the blocks were put together, I had this picture that was very realistic. And it traveled for two years. The dog was just so happy after our six-mile run. It was a beautiful sunny day. So the blue of the lake was really bright and the grass was green. I do have that picture of that quilt on my phone as my screensaver. So it's the favorite for a couple reasons. One, it was my dog. Two, I developed a new technique to build that quilt. The other quilt, and it in itself was nothing special. It was a mystery through our guild. And, you know, every week they gave you a new clue. And at the end, they just said, put it together any way you want. Well, I was so new at, in like, a, I don't know how to design and where to put these blocks. And anyway, it looked a little hodgepodge. But I remember when I quilted it, I always do my own quilting on my own domestic machine. And I remember kind of struggling along and somewhere in the middle of that quilt, I got the rhythm. You know, it's kind of like riding a bike. Well, you don't know what you did different, but all of a sudden it clicks. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I've got the hang of it. And that quilt is special just for that reason, that that was the point during quilting that quilt where I just thought I finally now have confidence in quilting. And if I can do this, I can do more quilting and better quilting. But it was the light bulb moment that said, oh, I think I've got the hang of it. (laughs) Isn't that amazing how that works? You explained it so well that 
You're not sure exactly what you did different, but finally you got it. Yeah. <laughs> what tool are you so happy that you have that you use? Paula, that's kind of a funny story. So when I was first starting quilting, I would go to a show and my more experienced quilting friends were like, you have to get this. and Oh my gosh, you need that and get this. And so I did. Also, my guild in Virginia, during every retreat, they always gave away some tool or something. And so I had the stash of tools that I don't know that I ever really utilized. We also had someone demonstrate one time the Susan Cleveland piping hot binding. It came in two sizes and they were demonstrating it on piping around a pillow. But I thought, oh my gosh, that's great. I remember going out and buying both the normal size and the wider size. Then it sat in my drawer for like five years. And I finally decided, you know what? I'm just going to kind of systematically start going through that drawer. And if I don't like the tool, I'm going to give it away or I'm really going to start using it. And this is the one that I kick myself saying, why did I wait five years <laughs> to try using this? I mean, it takes another 10 minutes to read the instructions and do it, but it gives you such a wonderful little finish to the quilt or even as a little piping between your borders that I just really enjoy it. And I just keep thinking, oh, I could have been doing this <laughs> for a lot longer. So that's the tool that is my current favorite. I like that you added current favorite. <laughs> <laughs> With all the parts of quilting, do you like each step along the way or do you have a step that you really look forward to? I can tell you that I don't enjoy sandwiching them. It's so hard for me to get the wrinkles out. And to pin baste it, you know, I try doing it on a table or the floor and then my knees hurt. So that one is definitely not my favorite. I do enjoy the quilting and I've learned not to rush just to take my time. If I start getting impatient, then it's time for me to stop and walk away because the quilting won't be good. I used to walk in and think, oh, I'm going to get this whole section done this afternoon. And I realized that's kind of the wrong attitude. I just need to quilt as long as I'm comfortable and it's going well. And if I get tired or impatient, I need to walk away. I do really enjoy the quilting. Now designing, I have a lot of fun designing. However, <laughs> I'm kind of out of my element. I already told you that my background was accounting and business, so I don't have an art degree. So I make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> But I still have so much fun. And oftentimes in my design, my design ideas exceed my capabilities. <laughs> so I design it and then I start trying to create it and say, Ugh, I don't know how to do that. So then I design it over again and then something else happens and I'm like, well, that's not coming together right. So I might have to go through design option three, four, and five before I get to a finished quilt. But to me, and maybe this goes back to making my own Barbie doll clothes and wanting to design the own clothes, is it's so freeing to draft your own quilt. I don't have to search for the perfect pattern. I can draft it up myself. So I have a lot of fun doing that. It is fun to design. I'm finding, I don't know if I would call it two camps or just two ways to go about it. Because some people probably could do both. But people see a pattern they want and they go and make that pattern. Or there's people that see things in their head and they want to create something. And lately I got a pattern and I realized my first thought was, how can I change this? So I think I'm in the camp that wants to design. But I love that. I think that's a very fun thing. And I've done that for years. I'll start doing something. And I'm like, well, why are they doing it this way? I mean, there's a better way or a different way. And I change it midstream too. I think that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Share your worst quilting experience. 
my worst quilting experience early on, probably right after taking that first class with Frances was her name, who was upset that I was missing class. She encouraged me to join the Quilt Guild, which was a fabulous thing. And I met some wonderful people and learned a lot. I went to one of the quilt retreats. So my very, very first quilt retreat. The pattern was Burgoyne Surrounded, which has a lot of pieces. It was a class being offered by the guild. And it was for like a queen size quilt. And I remember calling the lady and saying, I'm a new quilter. I have no idea what this pattern looks like. Is there any way for me to size it down and do just a smaller version without having to buy 10 yards of fabric? And she basically told me, no, there, no, there isn't. She wasn't going to take the time to do that. So I'm like, okay, fine. Well, you needed some lights and some darks and some medium fabrics. I went to the store and I bought that or what I thought was light and dark and medium. (laughs) And I ended up with some drapery kind of weight fabric (laughs) and my light and darks didn't have enough contrast. There wasn't enough value difference between them. And I remember going to the class and I just didn't get very far. So I took it to this retreat and I was going to work on it. And I was building these blocks and I put them up on the design wall about 11 o'clock at night. And my new friends around me looked at that. I also was having problems with the weight of the drapery fabric with the cottons. So I was having problems and the stitches weren't quite right. But I put it up on the design wall and you could not tell the lights from the darks and the mediums. (laughs) And I just wanted to cry. I'd been working on it all day. This is terrible. And they're like, well, so you should have had something a little darker here. And you should have had something a little. And I said, I'm going to bed. I'm just so upset about this. Well, the next morning, some of the ladies had taken some of their more neutral colors and they pinned it over some of the pieces just to illustrate for me. If I substituted in some of the light, make it really light, it would work. So we saved it enough that I could make a small baby quilt and I finished it. And I remember once I got to Virginia, I donated it to one of our auctions. And one of my friends said, are you sure you want to give this away? This is like your second quilt ever. And I said, yes, <laughs> I want to get rid of it. She goes, I'm going to give it to my granddaughter as a doll quilt. Are you sure? <laughs> I'm like, yes, I am very sure. <laughs> I was almost expecting you to say you had to take all the drapery fabric out of it. We did take some of it out, but when we substituted in the whites, I gutted through it and made it work. Again, good lesson learned there. (laughs) (laughs) That was so nice of those ladies to go ahead and put some things up there rather than you have to deal with making those decisions and you could just walk in and see it. It was because I truly, when I went to bed, I thought I'm packing up and going home tomorrow morning. I'm just quitting. (laughs) (laughs) We have the freedom to do so many things. What brings you back to making more quilts or continuing to make quilts rather than spend your valuable time doing anything else? I always admired the quilts that my grandmother made. And most of them were very utilitarian. I remember she always had one in the trunk of the car. So when we would go fishing, she would pull it out of the trunk of the car and throw it on the grass. But she definitely used her quilts. But For a long time, I thought they had very few tools and color choices to make the quilts. And they still turned out very, very lovely. And in some cases, very stunning with leftover dress fabric or men's shirts or whatever. I mean, just whatever fabrics they had, they still did a beautiful job. And I thought, you know, this was women's art before it was art. They were incorporating the art into their daily living and daily lives of making the bedding that they needed. And I just thought that was really cool. 
So one of my philosophies have been to kind of make it like my grandmother did, which is why I always quilted it myself as opposed to sending it to a long armor. And I've always tried not to buy a matching line of fabric. But I think of it as an art, a women's art. And I know there's a lot of men quilters. And I had an uncle who was a very prolific quilter. But I just like that it was an art form before it it was recognized as a fiber art. And there's something soothing about the weight of the fabric and the weight of the quilt. It's just been the hobby that I have stuck with. And when you ask that question, now I'm thinking more about it. I'm like, hmm, <laughs> yeah, there is a lot of things that I like to do. And what else would I do if I couldn't quilt? I don't know. Yeah, that's great. Diane, who do you make your quilts for? I make them for family and friends predominantly. Even the challenge quilts that I do, I don't make them just because it's a challenge and I want to participate. I'll only participate if I've got a very interesting design idea and I've got an idea of who the quilt might go to when I'm done. So the Cherrywood Van Gogh challenge, the inspiration was my nephew's crayon drawing. So he gets that quilt when I'm done showing it in lectures. I did another one kind of in memory of my father. And that was a birthday present for my sister. I made happy 50th birthday presents for all my siblings. <laughs> I've made wedding quilts for everybody, including my sons and graduation quilts from college for everybody. So I usually like to have a purpose for the quilt or who I'm going to donate it to. I still have tons of quilts that I do just for myself and for my husband. And my husband is not shy about saying, hey, I want one with all my ski t-shirts or I want one with this fabric. <laughs> so for a while, I was making a lot of baby quilts for friends. And my husband would come home and say, hey, somebody in the office is having a baby. And I told him you'd make him a quilt and you would make it with whatever colors they wanted. And I had to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> First of all, I would prefer to just do whatever I have without going and buying something special. And not everybody appreciates all the time and effort you put into something. I do remember one baby shower. My husband kind of sprung this on me. And I quick dropped everything I was doing to make this baby quilt. I went to the shower and she barely held it up and tossed it down. And, and finally someone said, wait, 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 pass that one around. Let's see it. I thought then and there, you know what, unless it's someone very dear, I am not going to take the time to make a quilt for either a wedding or a baby shower or anything like that. <laughs> so you got to be on the special list, Paula, to get a quilt. <laughs> <laughs> what are you working on right now? Currently, the project is kind of a collage quilt. It's for the Wisconsin Quilt Show, and their challenge this year has to do with 1973, and it's a specific anniversary year for the show. I think it's called Back in 19. 73. Well, my first car was a 1973 VW Bug. <laughs> Super Beetle. It had a sunroof. And so I am doing a kind of close-up picture of half of the front of the car. And I snow dyed blue fabric to be on the side of the car. And I'm going to do a lot of really fun, like 70s peace signs and all that in that big open space. And I've got the top pretty done. I've just got to start quilting. And I just told my husband the other day, it's due in June. It's already May. I've got to start quilting it. It's 30 by 40, so it shouldn't take me too long. But that's the project that I've been working on. And that's an example, too, of who I make them for. In this case, I wouldn't necessarily need a hippie quilt to hang on my walls, but I wouldn't mind a picture of my first car hanging in my sewing room. 
So that has personal appeal to me and a purpose for when it's done. If it makes it into the exhibit, I'll travel for two years. But that's a quilt that I wouldn't mind having hanging in my sewing room. And I'm still hoping that my mom can come up with a picture of me standing beside my car. So I can put that as part of the label. Oh, that would be fun. I hope she finds it. I do too. Describe your sewing space. Well, my sewing space has grown and changed over time. I've started with just the dining room table and then graduated to half of an office or extra bedroom. And now I'm very fortunate to have a large bedroom size space in our basement. And it's not a walkout, but I do have windows. I have two double windows. And unfortunately, we had some water damage a couple years ago. But the advantage to the water damage was when I redid that room, I added excellent, excellent lighting. (laughs) So if anything good came from the water damage was that my sewing room got a makeover and it has very good lighting in there now. From before we were married, my husband had a German Eckbank from IKEA and an Eckbank, it's a corner table. It has like two sides, an L-shaped bench, and then the table that sits in front of it. And that was his kitchen table for a long time. I use that for sewing. It's super sturdy. It doesn't bounce or anything. And I can sit on one side and sew, and I can go to the other side of the bench and sit and draft things or cut something out. I've got it lined with cushions and some pretty yellow and blue pillows. So it's nice and bright down there. I have a little blue and white balance hanging above the windows and I've got quilts on multiple walls. I right now have two antique and you can relate to antique furniture in your house. One came from my parents. It was a small wardrobe that my mom thought used to be in the bathroom just to keep linens and stuff. And I built some shelves in there and I've got fabric in there. And then the other side is a more intricate antique armoire, which looks very, very similar to one that my great grandfather bought for my great grandmother when she agreed to leave Germany and finally come meet him. She was so scared to leave. So he bought her this armoire as a welcoming present. But my sister has that one. And then this one was something I picked up at a flea market, but it's very, very similar. So that has a stash of fabrics. And right now I've been using a drop leaf table that I can open up as my bigger cutting area. But I finally decided I need to invest in a sturdier table. The drop leaf table is a family antique. My mom doesn't remember the history of it, which is kind of sad. But I don't want to be leaning on it and break something. So I'm going to position that someplace else where it gets a little less wear and tear and invest in a real cutting space. The bedroom had previously been used as a kid's play area by the previous owners. So it had that really soft, foamy mat puzzle things that go together on the floor in all primary colors and a chalkboard on one side, lower half of the wall. So I covered the puzzle mat because I figured, you know, when we sell the house and move on, some family will like that. So I use that as my carpet padding. And now I have just a custom-made area rug that sits over that and the chalkboard. I make notes to myself (laughs) on that. So that we're keeping too, but that's my sewing space. Uh, I do have a TV down there, but I rarely turn the TV on anymore. I I used to have it on all the time when I sewed. And I would say over the last two years, I just like the quiet. I think better and have more creative ideas without the background noise of the TV. I don't know why it surprises me, but I am finding more and more people that like that quiet. Share a quilting tip. 
I guess my quilting tip would be just generic. I've learned this from teaching. So many people will say, oh, I can't do that. Or I don't know how to modify a pattern or I can never quilt a quilt. I have to send it to the long armor. And I guess my tip would be just try. You're not going to get it right the first time. Practice on charity quilts, practice on baby quilts. I did teach someone one of my techniques a couple years ago and she was using it. And then this winter in Florida, she wanted to start learning to free motion machine quilt. So we started her off with some little quilt sandwiches and she was just kind of tracing the outline of whatever was printed on the fabric. And she just kept saying, I'm never going to get the hang of it. I'm never going to get the hang of it. And after two weeks of practicing, she said, oh my gosh, I think I can do this now. So just keep trying and practice and you will get better at your machine quilting or Y seams or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That goes back to your, it suddenly clicked. Yes. I'm always assuming that people started quilting as a hobby. I like to ask how it went from being a hobby to becoming a business for you. Oh, Paula, that's a good story, too. <laughs> <laughs> I had moved from Virginia to Iowa, so I was relatively new. And the membership form that you fill out every year at the bottom, it says, tell us the things you're good at. It's their nice way of trying to find volunteers to be secretary or treasurer or whatever. Well, I filled in the blank and said, if you're ever in a pinch for a speaker, I could talk to you about my experiences doing challenge quilts. And no kidding, two weeks later, I get a phone call from the program coordinator and she says, Diane, we would like to have you do this lecture in August, just before we launch our guild challenge. So we want you to get everybody all excited and inspired to do challenges. And then we're going to say, here's our reveal. This is what we're going to do. And hopefully we'll get everybody to sign up. And I'm like, okay, that sounds great. She says, I need two things from you. I need the title of the lecture and how much you're charging. So I hung up the phone and I turned to my husband and I said, Tim, they want to pay me for this because as a member of the guild, I was just going to do it for free. And I remember my husband saying, take the money, take the money. <laughs> and then I thought, well, here I'm the new person in Iowa. They don't really know me. I bet my friends in Virginia who have known me for years and know my skill level, maybe they would be interested in hearing me speak as well. So then I talked to a couple guilds there and I organized like four lectures within two weeks. So I drove out to Virginia and did four lectures in two weeks and came back. And so that's how it kind of got started. I remember starting to advertise a little bit for it. And the Des Moines, Iowa Guild, which is kind of large, the woman reached out to me. And as we're talking, we're like, wow, we have things in common. She grew up in Iowa, lived in Virginia, moved back to Iowa. So that was similar to me. We decided to meet halfway to have lunch. So we had a lovely lunch and we realized, you know, we were probably in the same places, just like a decade apart. So she's talked about what kind of lectures and she says, well, we're going to want two lectures and two workshops. And I said, well, I'm just getting started in this and I really wasn't planning to do any workshop. I was just going to do the lectures. And I remember she patted my arm and said, honey, <laughs> you have a year to figure it out. We want two workshops. <laughs> <laughs> and my thought, Paula, was I'm not a super duper quilter. I'm just like everybody else. What can I teach that everybody else doesn't already know? So that's kind of where I struggled. Now, the other funny story about starting to lecture was my brother was joking and he said, people really pay you to speak? He says, I would pay you to be quiet. <laughs> and my husband very politely under his breath said, I would too, but I think that would cost me a lot more money. <laughs> <laughs> my husband's got a great sense of humor. So he adds those little things in every once in a while just to get a reaction. <laughs> 
So that's how it all got started. And I actually, in my civilian job for the Army, I spoke at conferences on quality assurance and quality control issues all across the country and even into Canada and in in Europe when I lived there. So speaking in front of a large audience was never a problem for me after I got over being shy in grade school. But I was used to speaking at large groups. So if I could speak on a technical topic, I definitely could speak about a hobby that I love. I was wondering how that came together to start speaking. So you did have a little bit of that background. That's great. Share the name of your business and tell us how you came up with that name. I'm kind of boring, Paula. It's just my name, Diane L. Murtha. And I started thinking about a cute name and I just really couldn't come up with anything that I wanted to keep for an extended period of time. I mentioned speaking with large groups for my professional work. I also did a lot of mentoring. No matter where I was in my career, I was always a proponent of mentoring and helping others. So one thought about just using my name was that I could grow this to be not just speaking about quilting, but doing motivational speaking. And I did speak to the St. Ambrose University Young Professionals last September. And I'm going to be looking into doing other motivational presentations to colleges and things like that. So by keeping it kind of neutral, I can transition from quilting to something else. Oh, good. And can you share the fun story of why you need the L in your name? Oh, yes. So in Virginia, Northern Virginia is a fairly large area. We had over 11 chapters to our large quilt guild. I joined the Burke chapter. There was another woman also named Diane Murtha in the Springfield chapter. And I did not know that. One met in the evening, one met during the day. And our paths never crossed until I got ready to move to Iowa. And in our newsletter that goes out to all 11 of those chapters, I posted that I'm giving away some furniture or selling some furniture. And I got an email from someone and the woman said, Here, I thought we were friends, and I find out you're moving in a newsletter. And I politely wrote back and said, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. And then I thought, is there really someone else with my same name? Well, didn't really think much about it. When I was back there to do my first lecture tour, somebody was having an estate sale, a fabric sale. And one of the B groups were helping the family organize it and checking out and all of that. Well, I'm having a great time shopping the fabric and talking to old friends. And all of a sudden I hear somebody say, well, the real Diane Murtha come to the front. (laughs) So I walk up to the cashier area. Well, the other Diane Murtha, who turns out to be a long armor, was checking out and writing a check. And my friend Marilyn looked at it and said, do you have Diane's permission to use her checkbook? (laughs) And she says, I don't know what you're talking about. I am Diane. And the woman says, no, you are not. I know Diane Murtha and you are not her. And she's getting ready to like call the police because she thinks this woman stole my checkbook. And another friend comes running up and said, wait, 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 there's two of them. (laughs) So they called me up so that I could meet her and we chatted and she said, yeah, I'm a long armor. She was like getting these emails about teaching classes and I don't know what they're talking about. So we realized then that people were mistaking the two of us and I think her middle name was Marie or something. So we just decided she could be Diane Murtha and I would be Diane L. Murtha. And, you know, we chatted for a while. We figured our husbands or cousins of, you know, second or third cousins of some kind. But that was that story. So I am Diane L. for all professional purposes. (laughs) (laughs) And the lady didn't go to jail. So that's good. (laughs) Wow, that's so funny. So you gave lectures 
to guilds, but then at some point you started doing lectures that were not at guilds. Is that correct? Well, mostly just guilds. And then I do them at shows too. The best thing about lectures is when you get feedback, when people are nodding their heads in agreement or they laugh at the funny stories or they have questions, even on Zoom lectures, if they have questions about a quilt or want to make a comment, that is very rewarding. Is there a comment or question that pops in your mind that you thought, wow? (laughs) Two of them, actually. So on that first lecture tour to Virginia, because they were my early lectures, I did pass out little surveys at the end asking people what part did they like the best? What did they least like? Any other suggestions or something? Well, (laughs) one particular lecture, I'd asked the president, so what's the format? When can I expect to go on? And she says, well, I'll have my meeting. We'll do any reports and then you'll go on. So I'm thinking 30 some minutes. So I turned the projector off. She literally stood up there and said, good evening. Welcome, everybody. Any questions? No. Anything to report? No. Okay, Diane, you're up. (laughs) It caught me off guard and I kind of fumbled a little bit and I'm trying to talk while I'm getting the projector turned back on. And again, it's a new projector. I've only used it two times and I'm trying to get it going. Well, in the survey, somebody said, you really should know how to use your equipment. (laughs) And I thought, but the president told me. And then I'm like, okay, from now on, I'm leaving everything running. I'll just close the little slide over the front. Another time during that same four tour lecture with the surveys, somebody said, well, the seats were too hard. (laughs) (laughs) And I got the impression that they didn't always meet at this school. They usually met someplace else. And I thought, well, there's nothing I can do about the seats being hard. And I thought, But if she had told me she was uncomfortable, I've got a trunk full of quilts here. She could have sat on any of the quilts (laughs) to pad the seat if she'd only told me she was so uncomfortable. (laughs) (laughs) And then during one of those early lectures, when I got to the end and I said, are there any questions? The very first question was, are you willing to sell whatever quilt? And I literally said, I wasn't expecting that question. (laughs) And we talked later about the price and all that. That's not what I was expecting. (laughs) And those are the words that came out of my mouth. (laughs) Diane, tell us about how your quilts ended up being in books and getting to travel internationally. Okay, so I started participating in challenges, several by Donna DeSoto. And sometimes the challenge will just have quilts travel for a period of time, usually up to two years. Sometimes it's much shorter. And sometimes there's a book associated with it. If there's a book, the publisher reserves the right to do their own jurying process. So your quilt may be accepted into the exhibit, but may not make the cut to be in the book. So I've been fortunate that my quilts have been selected to be in both. So for Donna DeSoto, the first one was the Inspired by Elvis challenge, and the quilt was in the exhibit and in the book, and then also in Inspired by Endangered Species, and I did a cheetah. And it is super cool for them to travel, and the funnest thing for me is I'll get an email from someone, a friend in North Carolina or Texas, and they'll say, Diane, I just went to this quilt show and I walked by and I did this double take. And they said, I know you. And so they send me a picture of them beside my quilt. And that's for me more fun than even having me beside my quilt. It's seeing this parade of friends who see my quilt and take a picture of them with it. I think that's pretty cool. I was very excited that I participated in one that went to Australia and it traveled a bit there. There's some things on your bucket list that are fun and interesting. And I think people seeing my quilts in shows is really cool. Also for my mom, 
she's just thrilled to see if I'm on TV or in a book or a magazine. She just thinks that's like the top of the world. (laughs) How fun to share that with your mom. How cool. And you've gotten to author some articles for magazines? Yes. I am a regular author right now for Quilt Folk magazine. I've been doing two to three articles per issue for them. And I guess I've been writing for them for over a year, a year and a half, maybe. And then I also started writing for Family Motor Coach Association. We travel in our RV and we winter in Florida in the RV. And there are tons of quilters that travel in RVs or vacation in RVs. It's like 38,000 people that belong to this RV Quilters Facebook group. The magazine editor said, yes, we should be writing to this side of our audience. So I've been writing about four articles a year for their magazine. But I also write kind of regularly for the other quilting magazines, Quilting Arts Magazine, Quilting Art Studio, American Quilter, And I think that's it. So sometimes I'm writing an article that includes my quilts and talk about a technique, or sometimes I'm just writing about a tip or trick or something. I also have been writing for the various state shop hop magazine. And so that's when they do a statewide shop hop and all the participating quilt stores advertise in the magazine. And it has specific patterns related to the special fabric that is designed just for that state, for that particular shop hop. You take the passport around to all the stores and you see how many stamps you can get and win prizes. And in addition to the patterns and all the information about the quilt stores, there are various articles. So I've been writing for them as well. So will your article only show up in the Iowa edition or could it be in any state? Usually we pick a topic for a specific state. So last year I wrote an article about the Iowa Freedom Rocks. And there's one rock painted in patriotic colors in every county of Iowa. And that's kind of a whole story in itself. And then for Florida, I wrote about a historical society and museum. But I do write some generic articles that she can use in multiple state magazines. How neat. For Missouri, the one that will be coming out later this fall, I just wrote about the Pony Express because it got its start in Missouri. Yeah, I stumbled across that this year and I'm hoping to do the Ohio one. So I'll be looking for you. Yes, I already did a trivia style article for Ohio mixing terms and slang from Ohio with quilting trivia. It should be fun. Yeah, looking forward to that. And you also have just published your first book, is that correct? That is. The book is called Artful Insights in Fabric, Quilted Bits of Wit and Wisdom. And I call it a mini coffee table style book. It's not about techniques. It's beautiful pictures of my quilts with the humorous stories that go along with them. Some of my delusions of grandeur, my failures, (laughs) some of the laughs that my husband and I have had along the way, as well as talking a little bit about some of the techniques I might have used or created. And then there's also the more sentimental stories about the quilt I did after my dad died, and one of them that I did as a dog portrait after we lost our dog, Buddy. So it kind of covers the gamut, and I specifically tried to keep it very reasonable. It's nineteen ninety nine and available through Book Baby. I self-published, but it's available through Book Baby, Amazon, and also probably most of the bookstores by now. It's a nice kind of book that you could give to your mom, your grandmother, any of your aunts that had any interest or knew anybody who was a quilter. 
as well as your quilting buddies and your sisters and those kind of things. It's just a fun, easy read. I had one quilting friend who bought the book as she was driving from Florida back to New York. And she said, I'm on page 36 and I haven't stopped yet, (laughs) (laughs) which, you know, made me feel good. And then my husband was a huge supporter. I did all of the photos and the editing and the writing. And then he used the Adobe InDesign program to help me put it into page format. And we get to the very end and he goes, I'm just not sure about this title. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, is there really anything in there that's funny? (laughs) And I said, well, remember, I'm like, remember this story and remember that story. And he's like, oh, yeah, I forgot. I said, we've been laughing about those things for years. And he says, I guess I've just been looking past the words in this process that I kind of forgot about that. (laughs) And my family had encouraged me to start documenting some of the history of the quilts, what was going on in my life at the time, or why I did a specific quilt. Was it for a challenge? And then where did it travel? And and that kind of stuff. So it's an interesting little story. And, And again, I tried hard to keep it at a reasonable price. Yeah, that is reasonable. So how exciting was it when you saw the book come back to you in book form and it was ready for sale. Well, super exciting, but there's just was a little bit of a cloud over things. So my first goal was to have it published before the new year, 2023. We were in Florida. One of my brothers had a little bit of a health issue going on. And so I flew back home and spent about three weeks over the holidays here in Iowa, helping him out. So my husband and I were doing not the editing really, because the editing was done, but the page formatting and stuff long distance. He's doing something, sending it to me. I'm making corrections, sending it back to him. So that was a little stressful. And then our dog was diagnosed with lung cancer and we were terribly distraught. Here we thought she just had like an allergy or something. And The vet gives us this terrible news and basically she's got 30 to 60 days to live. So there was this little damper and the book came out. I was very excited to see it. And Book Baby even said, we really like the cover design. We would like to use it in our marketing and advertising. And I thought, well, that's a really nice compliment. So I said, sure. Well, we were in Florida and my husband said, let's do a book signing and reception for all of our friends in Florida and just really celebrate because these other couple of things had happened that had kind of put a damper on the release of the book. So let's do this. So it was all planned. I had this nice black culture dress (laughs) and we had the room with white Christmas lights and everything. And my husband came down with a terrible cold. (laughs) And he's like, I don't want to be around everybody. They're going to be worried about, is it COVID or is it not COVID? And he kept testing. It wasn't COVID. But he's like, no, I don't want to be there. And I thought, oh my gosh, here again, he was the one who insisted that we do something to help celebrate. And then he did decide he would stay on the open air balcony. So he was there off to the side because I said, man, here it goes again. (laughs) We were trying to do something special to celebrate the book. And then you can't be with me. (laughs) So he's like, I feel miserable, but fine. I'll stand on the balcony. (laughs) (laughs) But it is very fun. I've reached out and let a bunch of people know. And I've gotten very, very nice emails back from friends and saying, wow, you have a hidden talent. Not only can you quilt, but I didn't know you could write too. (laughs) So that's been fun. What a neat way to put those two things together though. How cool. Diane, is there anything else you wanted to share about your business? I would just say I do lectures for guilds and workshops for both guilds and big shows. And I really enjoy doing both. I do it in person and virtually. And what really thrills me is people being inspired by my stories. So the one lecture on my challenges, I talk about my successes and failures. And at the end of one lecture, somebody came up to me and said, 
I really loved hearing about all your failures and flops. And I thought, oh man, do I really have that many? But, you know, she says, no, it's encouraging because you've had some wonderful successes. She says, but if you have failures too, that just means it's okay for the rest of us. So I thought, all right, that's a good thing. So I'm always really tickled when people come up to me and said, I really loved your lecture. It's encouraged me to try whatever technique that I've been wanting to and was afraid to, or I teach somebody something and they're literally jumping up and down because they now know that they can do something that they didn't think they could. So I don't necessarily need you to take my classes or my lectures, but challenge yourself by taking classes and listening to lectures and even reading articles that may not be in the mainstream of the type of quilting you do because we always are learning something, adding tools to our quilting toolbox, and we never know when we might use them. Mm -hmm. And where can we go to find you? My website is my name, www.dianelmurtha.com. And there I list all of my lectures and my workshops. I also list a lot of the endorsements and nice comments I've gotten back from students and people regarding both the lecture and the workshops. I've got some pictures for each of those. And then I have a gallery that just shows a variety of my work. And it's quite eclectic. I never stay doing one thing very long. I'm always jumping to try something new or learn something different. And there's a little marketing video at the very beginning. And then other information on how to contact me, which is my Gmail address, dlmurtha2018 at gmail.com. And then I am on Instagram, Diane L. Murtha. I think that's it. Oh, great. And we can always check aquilterslife.com on your episode page to look for those links also. Well, Diane, thank you so much for joining me on A Quilter's Life. I so appreciated you spending your time with me and sharing your story. Loved hearing it. Paula, it was completely my pleasure. It was very fun chatting with you, and I sincerely enjoyed it. Goodbye. Bye-bye. find more stories on aquilterslife.com or subscribe on your favorite podcast player so each episode will be downloaded automatically. Also, I want to hear about you and your wonderful quilts. Please contact me, Paula Chamberlain, through the website to set up an interview. And as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.